This is CyberSound, your simplified and fundamentals-focused source for all things cybersecurity, with your hosts, Jason Pufall and Stephen Maresca. Hi, welcome to CyberSound. I'm Jason Pufall, as always, joined by Steve Maresca and Matt Fasaro. Hey, guys. How are you doing? So I think we decided to call this one Cyber Incident Monday. I uh, think so. Right? Uh, so it, it, it's the holiday season. Um, people are shopping, right? I think fewer people are going out to the malls. More people are shopping online. The reality is we know it's happening during work, right? And there's legitimate reasons for it. There's, you know, the people are buying things for gifts, maybe for, you know, staff. The, they could just simply buy, be buying things for the office like normal. Uh, clearly, people are also going to shop in their lunch hours or random times during the day for personal shopping, right? So the reality is it's happening. You're probably not going to put controls in to stop it. Uh, so I think the discussion we really want to have here is, you know, how do we how do we actually sort of enable employees to do it safely? Are there tips that we can give them? Um, you know, what are some of the potential uh, you know, pitfalls to, you know, to somebody shopping on, uh, online at work. Right. And I think we did want to start with a story around, um, I mean, I guess it's, a, you know, it's certainly an incident, right. It might not have been your traditional ransomware, but, uh, an event that occurred at one of our clients when a, an email administrator, if I recall, uh, was, was shopping and directed to kind of a, a, a illegitimate site that looked correct. Right. Yeah. We think, I think the main takeaway is that you know, the outcome was that because of shopping activity as sort of the prelude to this attack, uh, an attacker was able to take over a domain uh, by intercepting email, by modifying credentials and altering the, the fundamental information associated with this customer's website. That impacts a lot of things. Uh, it's reputational. It's huge impact for email flow. You know, all of the the customers of that entity, you know, were affected themselves. They couldn't reach anything. Um, so to recover from too. Yeah, yeah absolutely. When, when you have a domain takeover like that, now mm -hmm. you're getting it's a, a nightmare. The entity involved, the, the right. hosting provider. Yeah, it took, yeah. took <laughs> days <luck>. to resolve. <laughs> it did well, and, and days by design, right? Because your time to live for this stuff was set to actually take a long time to recover right, from. Right. Uh, so you know, the the hard part about it though was you know from from some of the you know useful tips is. The mail administrator in this case, I think, was using the, the the administrative credentials as the local logon for a PC. So, you know, that it was easy to collect those for the attacker uh, when that attack started. Right. And there was a phishing component also. You know, they were visiting a, a shopping website. They were expecting some sort of notification. Right. And they supplied their credentials. From there, it was a really straightforward step to log into to systems as if this individual um, and obtain the credentials and effectively subvert the workflow of domain management of network engineers. And from there, you know, the domain takeover is really quite straightforward. Modify the, the servers associated with the domain and off they go. So, so an event, an attack that probably took an hour to execute, I think resulted in, geez, I have 10 plus people's time over the course of a week to recover from. Like it was a hugely disruptive event uh, you know, the institution was mad, right? Because they had a reputational issue more than anything else. Uh, of course, it happened over the holidays because it's a really popular time to do it. If I recall, it probably happened, I want to say it happened on Christmas Eve. I'm not 100% positive that going back. But it, but, it, but it was a common thing like that, right? It, you know, it's a Friday. It's a day before a holiday. It's on the holiday. That, that's the time that these things actually are, are executed. Right. There were secondary impacts, you know, difficult to reach support. You have to prove your identity. Right. How you would normally do that? Well, via codes delivered to your email, which you can't receive because your domain's been hijacked. Right. So just a vicious cycle. Right. So, you know, huge amount of disruption because an individual wanted to purchase something online, right? Which we see all day, every day during this time of year. Um, how do we how do we protect against that? You know, how do we enable people short of really complex, you know, firewall rules and some of these other things that people like to implement that, in my opinion, don't really provide a lot of value. And I think, you know, training and awareness is one of the bigger, one of the bigger helps here. Yeah. I mean, that, that early 2000s uh, mentality of let's block as much as possible, you know, web, web filtering has gotten, I think, much more permissive over the past, I don't know, five, 10 years or so. 
Uh, I don't know if you guys agree with that or not. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm sure it depends on where you are, but a lot of places are, they're pretty open. That's kind of the ideal. They want people to feel like they're not being censored at work, but that also means now you can get to a lot of websites that you wouldn't have normally gotten to. Yeah. They don't want to drive people home, right? They want people staying in the office, which means enabling them. Yeah. Protecting when you do allow all those things, it gets significantly more difficult, right? Um, you know, making sure that browsers are up to date, you know, you don't have extensions, uh, allowed all over the place. We, <laughs> our, our sock is, uh, probably very sick and tired of seeing all the coupon, uh, right. extensions out there that, uh, get alerted on all the time. So the, the bigger issue aside from, you know, the actual activity itself is that it's being performed on a system that's being used for legitimate business activity. It's, it's the confluence of maybe personal shopping with business systems that's the actual fundamental problem. And that's exacerbated by the use of organizational credentials and identities at that moment. So, you know, some organizations choose to have a, uh, you know, internet-only guest network that employees can use for this type of activity. And, you know, most people use their phones quite comfortably to do that. That's a fine way of facilitating something that might be culturally permitted. Um, Alternatively, just having separate accounts for privileged activity and unprivileged activity, that will put up a giant uh, stumbling block for an attacker trying to take over accounts or otherwise subvert systems. Right, yeah, agreed. So it, it's an interesting point you make because we always recommend keeping your, you know, your your personal activities on personal devices and your professional ones on professional devices, right? Don't commingle email accounts. Uh, ideally, right, to your point, Steve, use your phone or maybe a personal laptop uh, for shopping. Um, the reality is, you know, if, if I'm being honest, there's probably been a Zoom meeting or two where I've browsed websites uh, instead of listening to the <laughs> to the meeting, right? It, it, it's way harder to pull out your phone and surf on, on Amazon uh, during a Zoom meeting. We spend, we all spend a lot of time on that. Uh, you know, we don't want to pretend that people are only going to use personal devices for this stuff, right? Um, I think you're, I think the point about making sure you have you know, non-administrative credentials is really a key one. I mean, that, that was such a critical component of the incident that we talked about earlier. Yeah, I, I think I agree with your other point, which is effectively, they're going to do it anyway. They're going to do it anyway. Everyone does it anyway. The only way to prevent it realistically is a draconian environment that no one actually implements right. in reality. So, you know, what do you do realistically? Well, defend browsers. Spam use, filtering. Yeah, spam filtering. Use ad blockers if it's permissible. Uh, defend against the likely paths for that type of attack. Uh, you want to make sure that workstations are up to date and they're not using browser plugins that aren't that are out of date. That's the typical drive-by attack. You get rid of that and you, you have a more subdued attack surface. Yeah, that, I was just going to mention with, with that. Most of these are going to be, like Steve said, drive-by attacks, or they're going to be opportunistic, right? You're, you're not going to see a lot of advanced APT-type malware that is going to take over systems like this. This is going to be your average everyday stuff, right? right? It, Absolutely. Some of them aren't even really targeting businesses. They're really targeting you know, the, the at-home user, right? They're just looking to disrupt or get them to call a number and steal a credit card or something right. like that. Right. Exactly. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not always the, the advanced things, but you know, recognizing that generalized security awareness training is how you equip right. general users to avoid these types of issues. Uh, unrealistic expectations are that every user is going to detect something, but at least you'll make them think twice when they receive an email that is a little strange or encounter a website that's uh, unexpected in terms of its representation, that's where you start. But you keep, make it interesting. And I think the trouble with security awareness training all the time <laughs> is, you know, we say the same things, right? Don't, when you see phishing, you know, look for a malformed email address or be suspicious of the URL. But the reality is have a conversation with your employees that it's the holidays and you're going to see these types of attacks. Like be explicit about it. And I think if you anchor that in something that's going to happen over the next say three to four weeks, people will pay more attention. Don't be as vague as I think we often are. We're our own worst enemies in that regard sometimes. Yeah, I mean, realistically, the holidays, whether we're talking about Thanksgiving or, or Christmas or you name it, that's when our guard is down. People are on vacation. There needs to be some sort of secondary 
hey, have your heads up, look for things type of uh, advisor. Yeah, absolutely. Paying attention is critical. So I think we we talked a tiny bit as we were preparing for this around the idea of sort of third-party processors and some of these other you know, payment mechanisms out there. I think we're used to seeing things now. Clearly, right, credit cards, common. Uh, PayPal integration and you know, maybe like an Apple Pay, you know, much more common. Uh, but we probably see some, some other payment processors out there that are less frequently, you know, that you, you run into less frequently, right? Is there risk to those in your opinion or is there any reason to avoid some of these other things? Yeah, I, so... It's, t- it's tough to answer the the avoid question, right? It, there's there's good reputations, there's bad reputations to, you know, you've got uh, places like Affirm that are pretty popular now, Shopify. A lot of them are, you know, buy now, pay later type style. Right. But, but um, still new purchases. to many people, realistically. Exactly. Yeah. But but you have to also remember is that there a lot of them are doing credit checks, so they're going to be asking for a lot more personal information than just your credit card, right? It's easy to recover a credit card, but once your social security number's out there. Right. That's that's a little bit more difficult. So, uh, being aware of that and not necessarily using your corporate network to be transmitting your social security number to you know buy a Where? laptop for for little Johnny, <laughs> you know, right. <laughs> right. and and ultimately, you know, if you're using one of them because it's attractive, because you don't have the amount of money that's necessary at that very moment, then right. do some secondary research, open another tab, determine if it's legitimate. It doesn't take very much searching realistically exactly right yeah it's it's easy to vet most of these things and you know if you if you have questions i mean you i haven't personally tried this before but i'm sure you can reach out to either your banks or your um, credit monitoring if you if you do have it ask them about it i'm sure they've got helplines that can you know kind of attest to whether those are legitimate organizations or not yeah that's fair and, and i think um, you named a couple of really common ones right so yeah. uh, but it is interesting to see that the integration of some of these the, third-party services and people are really using different, you know, are spending money in different ways, right? Or accessing money in different ways now. So you have to be mindful of that. Again, returning to the, the gift giving aspect, you know, this is the time for gift cards. Gift card scams oh, are very yeah. common. Uh, that's a good point. Uh, incentives during the holidays in the form of gift cards are actually occurring in the workplace. So, you know, distinguishing between real and fake in that context might be a challenge for some people. Really just make a phone call. Make yeah. sure it's legitimate. Phone call, walk over to the office, yes, right. something like that. Verify that they're actually asking for that gift card. Well, I mean, let's face it. Th- there's really never an emergency gift card giving requirement. Like, right. it, like you just don't have the, you have to buy it this second or else, right, some bad thing's going to happen. So be suspicious of those. Uh, but, and we see it all the time and they, and they work and they're, and they're, and they're persistent. I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll try a variety of different ways to get people to spend money on that. So, um, so I think. You know, kind of coming back to this, uh, really at the beginning, you, we, we do want to talk to our employees about the fact that it is the season and you, you probably don't want to say, you know, spend all your time shopping, but you don't want to, you don't want to pretend they're not going to. And I think it's important to have these conversations to do your best to protect your organization from kind of the common things that we talk about really in a lot of these episodes, right? Again, it, it, these aren't really complicated attacks that we're talking about. It's basic awareness and just sort of being careful about where you're at. Yeah, acknowledging it without sounding punitive so that people right. feel inclined to listen and think on the behalf of the organization and recognize there's a, a personal component too. Yeah, I mean, that's fair, right? And and, uh, and know that it'll probably, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll quiet down in a few more weeks, right? We're in, we're in that season. So you do your best to weather the storm and, and kind of get through it. Uh, any, you know, sort of any final Thoughts at all that, you know, I think we talked a little bit about sort of pop-up blockers and coupon trackers and some of these other sort of interesting things people encounter. Um, anything that jumps out as a, as a final idea? I, I think I'd say, you know, if you if your organization does have website filtering by category or something like that, just recognize that they're not 100% solutions. They're at best, you know, 40, 60% if you're lucky. Yeah. That there's yeah. always a new vendor out there that's right. not been classified it, it's the nature of the beast so if you have them and you rely on them because you think that they are reliable know that it's a you know an arrow in the quiver but not the be all end all yeah I, doing things like that and just making sure that you know your visibility systems are up and working you're you know, you're getting 
at least some logs from your firewalls, the usual things we talk about, right? Make sure that your systems are actually catching the data that you, you want. And if it does come down to having an incident, at least to be ready. Yeah, that's reasonable. So I think as a, as a quick ending, uh, we just want to say happy holidays. Uh, don't be afraid of holiday shopping. Uh, talk to your employees, of course. Um, if you have concerns around this you know, that, that run any deeper than this conversation, you know, feel free to reach out to us at Vancourt on LinkedIn or Vancourt Security at Twitter. Uh, and as always, thanks, Steve and Matt, for joining us today. And we hope that people got value out of this. Take care. Stay vigilant. Stay resilient. This has been CyberSound.